first of all, I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank you, uh, Rich and Jim. I'm sorry you had to leave. Um, and Stephanie and Kristen, who is still working hard outside the door. Uh, and also the rest of the NCAR staff, who I didn't get a chance to meet, but I hope that I will, uh, who've worked so hard to pull this workshop together. Um, I'm really honored to open a dialogue today. Um, we'll be continuing the dialogue throughout this workshop. And we're going to be discussing diversity in the computational geosciences. But in my mind, the first, the first step is to understand three questions. And those three questions will help us focus on what we're doing together and why we're doing it. And those questions are, why here? Why us? And why now? Well, to be honest, these were exactly the questions that I asked Stephanie when I was invited to be the keynote speaker. <laughs> why me? Uh, first of all, I'm not a computational scientist. I will confess that up front. I don't like pretending, and I don't like uh, masquerading. Nor am I a computational geoscientist. I'm not even a geoscientist, although at one point in my career, I was an ocean scientist. Um, but I am passionate about diversity, and I'm passionate about the next generation. Um, so I realized that what I had to do in, in wrestling with an answer to those questions and with and wrestling with also this um, imposter syndrome that I have terribly badly, and I think most of us do at some time or another, um, I realized that it would help us get serious about what we're doing at this workshop if I shared a little bit of my personal perspective, because we share so many values in what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we're doing what we're doing and why it's so important that we do it now. Uh, let's see if this works. So we, I think we're all aware in this room that really the biggest challenge facing us right now is uh, global climate change. And this gets us to why here. And I think that uh, Jim answered that to a certain extent, that we are at the place that focuses on this challenge. Uh, it stands to reason that NCAR, a center that stares into the future on a regular basis, would, would be really well placed to recognize a disaster in the making. And NCAR is also well placed to know that the, geosci the workforce within the geo computational geosciences, um, they would be well placed to know its status because NCAR is kind of at the center of that community. And if you look around at your own community, you not only see who's there, but you see who's not there. So I think that the computational geosciences are particularly well placed to lead efforts to diversify the scientific workforce. And that is in, because Earth's compelling challenge was initially recognized by the work of geoscientists and by computational, ge uh, computational scientists. And it was putting those two together that helped to create the, the picture of what it is that's happening. So why is global climate change such an important driver? Um, there are a number of reasons. And we'll start with the fact that it's real. It's happening now. And uh, it will impact all living things, not just human beings. Little things that aren't so cute, middle-sized things that are incredibly cute, and bigger things <laughs> that are cute too, actually. <laughs> um, it's going to affect all of us, but it's also going to affect us in ways that we don't yet understand. All regions are going to have to respond. And uh, in case you don't recognize this picture, which most of you won't, this is my neighborhood. And this was a day this year in May when we had nine fires raging, and all of us were packed, or we'd already left. I haven't unpacked, because I know what this year is going to hold for us. I know that it will hold something I don't expect. And I'm here in Colorado, which saw exactly the same thing last year. So we're facing an uncertain future. It's going to affect all of us. It'll be all regions, all countries, 
and all cultures, and we all have to know how to respond. Solutions are going to demand creativity. They're going to demand diverse perspectives. And we're going to have to be willing to investigate novel ideas that sort of break the mold. So mm -hmm. this will be uh, summarized in print as well. Um, the other thing is that diversity really matters to the geosciences. Why does it really matter to the geosciences? This is answering the question, why us? We just talked about why here. Now we're talking about why us. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Albert Einstein said something that really resonated to me. And that is that we can't solve our problems using the same thinking that we used when we created them. What does that mean? Well, it means that we need an intellectual shakeup. We need an infusion of new perspectives. We need to question our established habits and beliefs. And all these are necessary for any progress to happen toward finding solutions. Who are the people best qualified? They are the people who are not afraid of change. They are the people with the courage to question. And they are the people who have less to lose when change happens. So if you think about it, global climate change really challenges, challenges the global geosciences um, because it's the research area with the most to gain from increasing diversity. So that's why us. Well, there's another part of the why us. Um, why are we particularly well suited to facing this challenge? And it's because we have some marketing opportunities here. So let's start with marketing opportunity number one, computational. Computing's going to be in the limelight. It's going to be front and center. Because the decision makers are going to need to understand what's happening, and it's going to have to be clearly presented. Now, why does this put computing in the forefront, right in center stage? It's because the computing models and visualization tools make the evidence easier to understand. It's really complicated stuff. And most people looking at the numbers and the arrows and the graphs are going to go a little bit cross-eyed. But some of the visualization experts who've been working on this have come up with ways of showing us in very uh, intuitive ways what the data mean. The other thing is that simulations, computational simulations, are taking the evidence and giving us ways of showing what might happen, or what's likely to happen under a number of different scenarios. And when you start looking at all these things, computing looks downright sexy. So let's use it. Marketing opportunity number two. Geoscientists are going to gain broad appeal. First of all, it's, we have a meaningful challenge. Everybody knows this is important. And meaningful challenges attract diverse students who want to make a real and significant contribution to the world. The other thing is because the geosciences, particularly the computational geosciences, are so diverse. There are so many different elements of science that go into it. And it's not just science. It's science. It's art. It's all different kinds of talents. And so computational geosciences have an opportunity to appeal to those people with many different interests and talents. And for the same reason, um, that is its own diversity, <coughs> Excuse me, computational geosciences vividly demonstrate that there are many ways and scales at which one can contribute to solutions. Marketing opportunity number three, diversity itself is valued. Meaningful public action requires that people trust the information providers. Now, this is Meaningful public action is what is going to have to happen. And so it's 
really, really important that our field look diverse and look like the people that we're talking to. And that means not just me, all of us. Um, people are most likely to trust people who share their values. And so they want the people sharing information to be someone that they know shares their values. There are lots of different people out there, lots of different perspectives. We need to represent those in the field. And it's not just local, it's global. And when you think about the diversity of the global cultures, this is the kind of diversity that we need to represent in this field because we need to talk to lots of different people. So we have opportunities. And that's why I think it's a very exciting time for us to be focusing here at this workshop, because we want to take advantage of these opportunities. Um, the next part of the why me um, is the thing that I always feel when I sort of feel like I have to step front and center is, oh gosh, why me? What in the world can I really do? Um, it's terrifying. It's really daunting. And the scale of the challenge is such that many of us just want to crawl into a hole and forget about it. And I say us, meaning the general public, but it's more than the general public. Even those of us who see the data sometimes want to run away. However, we can make change. And like the, chal like the challenges of increasing diversity, um, like the challenges of the research itself, the challenge of increasing diversity can occur at many scales. And so that's what we have to think about, that each of us can make a little bit of a difference. So thinking a little bit about um, what do we mean by us, how can we have an impact, um, we could mean individuals in society. Uh, we could mean we as computational geoscientists in this room. Or we could mean we as the people in this room. And um, the first perspective is so broad, it's terrifying. And it would cover far more time than I have and far more than we can tackle in this workshop. Um, the second perspective, I already told you I claim no expertise. We have other speakers who are going to be talking to you later who are far better qualified to talk about that. And I'm going to leave it to them. Um, not just because I don't want to step on toes, because I don't want to make a fool of myself, a bigger fool of myself. And so I'm going to take the third perspective, we in this room, because I qualify. And I'm in the room with you. So um, let's start with who we are. We are a diverse group. Some of us are teachers. What can we do as teachers? Well, dang it. We can, first of all, start out by using words. When we define our field, we need to emphasize its diversity, not just the diversity of the field itself, but the diversity of all the elements within it. We need to create an image of computational geosciences that is itself diverse. We also need to use pedagogy. There are pedagogical methods, teaching methods, that have been shown. There's evidence that shows that they are useful in creating positive, inclusive environments for women, for minorities, and for those with different abilities. And we need to know what those are, and we need to use them. And that means things like calling on women as many times as we call on men in the classroom. It means using facilitated discussion, because that helps to bring out ideas. It helps to make people know that they can all make a difference. Um, it's a very exciting field, and it's a field where I'm beginning to learn more from my colleagues. And I suggest that if you teach and you're not using these, these uh, pedagogical tools, explore them, because they're fun. As STEM education leaders, and this is actually where I put myself, and a couple more people I know in the room also fit here, um, we have a real responsibility as we develop programs that we need to introduce the computational geosciences repeatedly within K through 20. Within the educational series, we need to start introducing kids very young to what the geosciences are. And we need to show how they contribute to solving relevant and important questions. If you think about it, kids in elementary school all say they want to, they want to be firefighters or helpers. They turn to the helping fields, because that's what kids are first taught it's important to do. 
And we need them to know that computational geoscientists are helpers. We are helping the world to face the future. And that needs to be presented from the very beginning. The other thing we need to do is for ourselves, for our image, we need to introduce computational geoscientists as real world problem solvers. And that has to come up many times in K through 20 education. And each time we do it, we need to highlight the diversity of the people who are part of this field, the cultures that contribute to it, and the perspectives, the many different perspectives that are essential to what we do. When I say we there, I'm saying STEM education leaders, but also really computational geoscientists. We need to have all of these perspectives. And then as computational geoscientists, or scientists in general, we can do what uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research has done so well. We can create opportunities for students to explore elements of computational geosciences throughout their career. And this is not just as high school students, but as undergraduates, as graduate students, and as postdocs. And there are ways that students can also explore the computational geosciences in the early years as well. For some, it's a little more challenging. But um, if you're not already doing outreach to K through 12, I encourage you to do so. Because you learn so much when you talk to young kids. Um, we can help to build support communities for students and for our professional colleagues in the ge computational geosciences. And we can help these communities to reflect the diversity of the people that we want to participate in our community. We can pull our colleagues, our diverse colleagues, into the planning rooms. We can pull them into the decision making. We can pull them into leadership positions. This is what has to happen to all of our professional communities at every level. They need to look like the diverse community that we want to be. And we, as scientists, can mentor students at every level. There is so much evidence that shows that mentoring is really key to success, particularly for women and minorities. If you ask any of those of us who have reached leadership positions in our field, we will be able to name our mentors before we can name anyone else in the field. The other thing we can do, and here I kind of need my notes, but I'm not sure I do. Um, we need to change the words that we use a little bit. Um, we present global climate change in big, scary words. And we can actually look at it as a challenge of stewardship and adaptation to a changing environment. And those words are not quite as scary. Um, we can ask questions that don't sound like they're insurmountable. They sound like they're kind of interesting and challenging. And they will attract people to the field. And those challenges, I'm going to drop the paper. I'm really sorry. This is awful. <laughs> um, those challenges are perhaps described as how can we adapt to environmental changes? And how can we be good stewards for our environment? Now, if you hear those, it doesn't matter how old you are, those are interesting questions. And they're not questions that will drive you away. They're questions that might even attract you to the field. The human challenge at every level is to create this partnership between man and the environment. Um, the challenge is also connect computational geoscientists to people with a wide variety of concerns and interests. And OK, I have to drop some of the paper before it drops without me planning it to do so. Um, the next question, why now? Um, global climate change cannot be reversed. It might perhaps be slowed. There's some doubt about that. Um, but some of the things we can do can slow it. And what we can really do um, is adapt, and adapt in a timely manner. But the challenges of global change do not allow us the luxury of waiting. The impacts to human civilization will increase. And waiting is not really going to get us any further. 
as Abraham Lincoln said, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. And that's where we sit right now. Um, our responsibility is to prepare the next generation to find solutions. And building a diverse and creative generation of next generation problem solvers will take time and multiple approaches. Solving these issues will also ex require collaboration and understanding that extends beyond the computational geosciences and into the social sciences, as many of the issues that we are facing are those of human interactions with the environment and with their own culture. And so they're complex. We have to go outside our comfort zone. We have to talk to people that we don't talk to every day. And we have to actually expand or raise the, the tent. The talents, skills, and knowledge that we're going to need include these. And these are really the computationally focused ones. But this is what the workforce looks like now. Um, I did this. This was the exercise that kept me up till 3 this morning. And I apologize. But it was really what I am most passionate about. And I wanted to be sure not to forget that it's the people that I really care about in this field that get me excited about working with all of you. Um, I did a little exercise. So these are pictures that I took of activities that San Diego Supercomputer Center is involved in that, that require all those skills and talents that you saw listed in the previous slide, that one. And that's just what I thought. These are the skills and knowledge that I thought of off the top of my head. And these are the pictures of the people doing it. So I took these pictures, and these were the pictures from my huge collection that had the most diverse people doing important things. And then I removed those slides that did not include women. So these at least include women. And then I removed the slides that did not include people of color. And this is what was left. I'm not proud of this. I will tell you, San Diego Supercomputer Center is one of the most welcoming, nurturing, supportive environments for minorities and women. And yet, this is what we have to show for it. Um, this is our challenge. And it's what brings me here today with a passion for what we're going to do and really a delight in being invited to be here. Um, those of us who make, oh, the other thing was, this is part of the why now. Um, I, I met a very, very interesting woman who's one of the women in this, in this picture. And I met her at a conference where she and I spent about three hours before she gave her keynote, because she too had imposter syndrome. Now, these are all people who are leaders, leaders in computational science, or leaders in some field of science. And yet, they too wrestle with, with this. <clears throat> and the woman that is pictured in the upper right part of your screen, upper right, yeah, Gayatri. And I talked about what she was doing in India. She has a wonderful project. If you haven't heard about it, um, you should. It's called The Fat Project, A Feminist Approach to Technology. And what she's doing in The Fat Project is she is recruiting young women, young women who are um, basically working in um, home service, if you will. Most of them have never touched a computer. They have no idea what computing is. And she's teaching them to use computers. And she has taught hundreds and hundreds of young women the skills and knowledge they need to get out of poverty and to contribute towards a solution. And she had imposter syndrome. She couldn't understand why anybody would want to know what she was doing. Um, these people in this picture are making huge and significant contributions now. Gayatri asked me what she had to share. And I said, well, why are you doing what you do? What is your passion? And she said, I looked at the, at the progress that women have made in the last 50 years. And they have gained that, that 
increased progress. They have gained more positions in leadership by increasing their knowledge to the point where they could contribute. Now, society is changing, and the leaders of the future will be those who do have technology and science know-how. They have to be savvy, because who wants to have a decision maker who doesn't know about technology? So unless women and minorities are holding that knowledge, they're going to be left out of the leadership roles. And we all know what happens when the leadership doesn't look like the rest of the people. We have a huge amount to lose. And the kinds of, of questions we need to answer are going to demand more and more knowledge. So it's terribly important that now, that we don't wait to diversify our ranks and diversify the ranks of those who are solving these problems so they can take leadership roles and make decisions that will represent all of us. It's a little less time than I was allotted, and I did that on purpose because, number one, if I talk for more than 30 minutes, I put myself to sleep. And number two, I really want to launch a dialogue. That's what we need to do in the next three days. We need to talk to each other, and we need to be creative. So I want to start with, are there any questions? Oh, <laughs> that's not a question. Yes. So one of the things, and it's not exactly related to all of the really rich content, thank you for that. You talked several times about the imposter syndrome. And I'm not sure that everybody who's here knows that syndrome. So stereotype threat, imposter syndrome. Could you talk about that a little so that people understand it better? It's one of the barriers for many of the It's a huge many barrier. The audience that you're It's a huge barrier. And um, at the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing, we've have an, had a number of sessions talking about it. And it has to do with the fact that um, Stereotypes hurt, and they hurt because at some level we hear them enough that we start to believe them. And what that means is that we're not really sure that we're up to the task, or we're not really sure that we belong in the room, or we're not really sure that we have something to contribute. And we feel that somehow when we stand up here at a podium, we're an imposter. And it's very, very hard to come up with the courage to voice your truth when you feel like you're an imposter. Um, it's funny, I was talking with a, a colleague of mine, who some of you know, Richard Moore. He is a extremely successful, extremely bright, extremely talented, and uh, wonderful white male. And um, I told him how I was feeling about this talk and how I was suffering from probably my second to worst bout of imposter syndrome. And he wrote back and he said, I've heard about that at the Grace Hopper conference. I couldn't believe when I went to a conference this year that I felt exactly the same way. I'm a white man of 60. Why the heck am I still feeling this crap? <laughs> we all feel it sometimes. and. We who have heard stereotypes, we who have at some point in our life faced someone looking at us and in something that they say or do indicating that we don't belong here, we feel it. And as hard as we fight it, it's going to be there. And it takes a lot of, just, you have to fight yourself. You have to fight yourself to overcome it. So that's part of our challenge is to help people recognize that they're not alone. They share that, and that everybody that they really admire has had to overcome it as well. And you probably still feel it. All those people in that last picture, I mean, can you believe some of these people? A Nobel laureate, the director of, I mean, you should know some of these faces. These people have made tremendous contributions to science, and they still sometimes feel imposter syndrome. So we're, a good, we're in good company, but uh, let's try and reduce it or else help people to overcome it. Is that what you meant? OK, thank you. Uh, other question? Well, an observation. Yes. Pre-kindergarten, we start getting these stereotype threats to lower status 
from Absolutely. people that love us and don't know any better on the words that they choose mm -hmm. or the actions that they take. And I'm not sure if everybody, uh, since this is being recorded, I will uh, repeat the question. And oh. the first one had to do with talking about the imposter syndrome. And the second one was a comment that the, the messages that we get that we, in some way, don't belong or don't measure up or should perhaps consider alternative careers start pre-kindergarten. They start very, very early with stereotyped role playing, with words that people use that suggest that perhaps something isn't where we should be playing, isn't what we should be doing. Somehow or other, we should be doing something different. Why don't I belong in the part of the preschool room where they're playing with the building blocks? Why should I go to the house? Why is it that I should not wear pink and purple if I'm a gay man? Why is it that somehow or other the boys are the ones who always get to do the dirty stuff? I like mud, too. These things tell us that somehow we don't belong there. And uh, honestly, it's, it's playing in the mud. It's playing with rocks. It's playing with nature. The things that boys are really encouraged to do and girls are not, um, those are the things that make us unafraid to explore. And that's why my previous, um, in my previous life, I, was, uh, I worked in a botanical garden. And I was, uh, my job was to raise the money for a children's garden. Because I believe so deeply that children, all children, need to get muddy, they need to get messy, they need to play outside, and they need to be unafraid of nature. Because they need to be unafraid of exploring. And when you're not afraid of exploring nature, you're not as afraid to ask questions. And you're not as afraid to rock the boat. And we need people who are not afraid to rock the boat in order to change the way we do things. So it's really important. Uh, yes? Talking about a comment, um, more than a question perhaps, but in addition to talking about where people belong, I think I've also noticed that we have specific language that can uh, influence how people think about learning. We say very commonly, oh, you're a quick study. Oh, you're, 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 you're sharp. You're, you're very fast, which conveys this idea that if you don't learn it quickly, if you struggle, then well, maybe you probably maybe if it's really hard, you should. It's just do not it. for you. And right. so yeah. there's it's not only the sense of, are, do you is is there sort of the, the gender of are you, are, do you fit in that room and playing the blocks? But does it quickly make sense to you or not? And oh, don't try so hard. Go over here where maybe this won't be so hard. And and some of this is really hard. Yeah, absolutely. So the the comment and I wholeheartedly agree is that the other message we give with our language is that if it's not easy for you, perhaps you just aren't right for that. And the fact is, all of the people who have made it to the top have struggled with something. And struggling is part of getting there. Um, an anecdote, I, as a parent, you struggle to do the very best job you can with your kids. You want to give them every advantage. But when I was a kid, I had to take piano lessons, and I hated it. So when I raised my kids, I did not force them to take music lessons. I waited until they asked. I learned very recently that perfect pitch is not something you're born with. Did you know that? I thought it was something you were born with, and none of my kids had it. So I didn't encourage them into music, because I thought, oh, your heart's just going to get broken like mine did. When I wanted to be Joan Baez and I couldn't sing like that, <laughs> I made deals with the devil. You, should, you couldn't believe what I said I would do <laughs> if I could just have that voice. But I didn't have that voice. I believed that you were born with perfect pitch, and that was it. Imagine my horror when I learned that if I had only started them t before the age of three, all three of them could have had perfect pitch. Well, one of my, one of my kids is a musician. And it is his passion. And I'm delighted. I have no idea if he'll ever support himself. But I'm delighted because I feel like less of a failure. Because the fact that I didn't give him that advantage, the fact that he had to work a little harder, did not dissuade him. 
So it is harder for some of us. It doesn't mean we won't get there, and that's the message we have to give, that people should be lauded and applauded and encouraged and told that when it's difficult, it just means you're really going to get it when you do. So stick with it. Um, other things people might want to say? Yes? Um, so quick question to build off the um, comment that somebody was making about our language limiting girls and people of color. I think it's also important to, to bear in mind it limits our boys too. Yes. Um, you, know, you say things like, you know, you should be a man, but what does that mean? The meaning that means that you should be strong and you should never be wrong and you should be you know, a protector and this kind of thing. <laughs> It's incredibly important to realize we're damaging our boys as well in exactly the same way we're damaging our girls. Absolutely, I agree. The comment was that we're, the language damages our boys as much as it damages our girls, or at least it damages them. And um, we need to recognize that whatever stereotypes we choose to include in our language will exclude somebody. And so we need to use language that's inclusive rather than language that excludes people. Yes. It should have been people in the environment. Thank you. <laughs> Correction. I stand corrected. This is good. We have to help each other because it's still a challenge. Yes? Yeah, I really liked your list of uh, the, the technology skills that people need to be successful in this field. And I think something that could help to augment that, because you also need skills to, to integrate the sciences, to work, to, to communicate with other people. And that is something, you know, that when I was, you know, a teenager and in my 20s, I said, you know, men and women are exactly the same. We can all do, we can every, you know, we can do anything we want to do. And then when you get older and you start re reading like the work of Deborah Tanner and such, that there are some intrinsic, mm -hmm differences, it doesn't mean that one can do something or and the other can't. But like when I whenever I go to and give a, uh, a lecture at a college or university, I always ask, you know, can I have a lunch or a pizza party with all the, you know, the, the, the women, the students majoring in science, the undergraduates as well as the, the graduates. You know, and I talk about some of these differences that, you know, a lot I think we don't want to talk about because we don't want to mean say that that means that some are unequal right, less than others but they're they're different there's no value and judgment there that yeah. i said you know some women are less comfortable doing public speaking in many cases in, intrinsically you can learn to do it mm -hmm. but i said you know if you want to get make something happen and you're in a meeting with a lot of people and everybody's talking and you don't quite feel comfortable speaking out, you can always go and talk to people afterwards and integrate and communicate and build consensus before the next meeting so that your views are, are heard and you have impact. And I said there, there are many paths and many ways to accomplish things and be an important player. And you don't have to say, oh, because you know that guy over there is answering every question like this, you know, that he's going to be successful and I'm not. Uh, so I try to tell young women that there are many paths to do it, and that to building consensus and integrating is something that you know is a, is a good strength. Absolutely, and I I I hope that the mic picked up some of what you were saying because it's really important. Um, and I I will acknowledge immediately that that list of skills was done actually for another purpose, focusing just on the computing related skills, but the team building skills, the, the skills that are necessary to communicate what we're doing and to build the consensus necessary for the actions we need to take uh, require a huge variety of skills that will require lots of talents. Not just talents, but skills and perspectives and communication skills, artistic skills. Um, one of my colleagues, whom I respect tremendously, is a data visualization specialist. He's actually trained as an architect. An architect. Very spatial. And he comes into the field. He learned computing after he became an architect. He came to this country and couldn't get, he would have had to get a whole new degree in architecture. So he said, I'm going to go for computing. And now he makes some of the most breathtakingly beautiful 
complex data visualizations I've ever seen. And they make things make sense in a way that words can't do it. So lots of talents, lots of skills. People should recognize that they can see themselves in the challenge ahead. Thank you. I don't want to go any, any further over my time limit. I see you looking at your watch. OK, any more questions? <laughs> yes. I have another comment. Um, I really like your example of, your, um, of you, the decisions you made with music for your students and that, or for your kids. And that's really actually something that's um, described in psychology as prolapses, that mm -hmm. you're trying to do it better for somebody that you are in charge of. And that's really an important piece to remember in mentoring. So I do think it's very good to um, do strive for near peer mentoring. We've tried that in a few programs where we had undergraduate and graduate students um, work with high school students, especially if they were of color or females to females. The mentoring was much more meaningful because they were able to say, you know, I also come from a family with a non traditional background and I still overcame this. And I wish you had taken math. I had taken math. You have to take math so you'll have an easier path. And so I think the sense of wanting to do it better for, it's, it's easiest to see for your own kids. But if you really have a strong mentoring relationship, that's also something that's been described. And I think it's good to remember and set that mentoring system up in that way. I, I agree. Uh, the comment was that it, because we tend to want to do it better than it was done to us, um, it's very important that we create um, near peer mentoring systems because we're going to remember things that happened fairly recently where we wanted to do things differently. Um, there are a lot of things I would have done differently, but I'm getting so old now I don't remember all of the ways I screwed up. <laughs> um, it would be very helpful if someone who was closer to their mistakes <laughs> could mentor the next ones along. Yes? Different comments. Something you said earlier, and something you said earlier, but something you just said. Um, I really liked the point that you brought up about trust and just going on the idea of mentoring. Um, the other, I think, another important thing that I try to keep in mind is that we have trust with different sorts of people based on how on different aspects of our identity. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll give a personal example. I went to a women's college. But I didn't particularly go to a women's college because I wanted to focus and in, in, uh, be a uh, woman amongst, I mean, as a scientist among women, I was just a major in science. I actually picked the college I went to because I have a learning disability. And the person who works at the college that I met in advance, I met him, I liked him, I knew it was going to be a good relationship. That's why I picked that college. That was the bigger, more important part of my identity. So sure, I could work with a woman, and I would have a certain, perhaps, level of trust with her for that reason. But that's not a, that's not as much a factor in my identity as my experiences, at least with my learning disability in education. So I think too, there's an issue of we want to near mentoring is a is a probably a good model, but we want to be careful too about assuming that. If you put a woman with a woman, that's necessarily right. going to be the main. Re that's, that doesn't necessarily mean that they would connect. I mean, they, they may connect on certain right. things, but have other reasons why they wouldn't connect. So, I, I think that's an important point that near peer assumes that you can define the near peer. Right. I guess and and sometimes yes. because uh, and the comment was that we have complex self identities. We aren't simple people. Um, I identify myself in many different ways. Um, my daughter identifies herself in ways that I don't identify myself, and yet she's always my daughter. Um, and so finding what a peer is involves understanding which element of mentoring we need at the time and seeking a peer within that mentoring, that kind of a mentoring relationship. I, I'll, I'll make one other comment that's somewhat relevant. Um, I've been mentoring a young man who's a computational astrophysicist. I don't even know the words he uses half the time. Um, he comes from another country. And he was trying to navigate the politics of graduate school and was about to drop out. Um, 
I met him at a conference, and he asked a question that wasn't understood by the presenter. And I understood it because I realized he was asking a political question. And so I helped him navigate the politics of dealing with an advisor who was not supportive, because that's where I had been. And I told him about how you construct your committee to, in some ways, offset the weaknesses of the advisor. You don't always know. I picked an advisor who was doing what I wanted to do, but never once talked science to me, because he never saw me as anything other than a woman. Seven years, and I had one good discussion with him, and it was a night before my defense. That, yeah, that didn't build so, so much confidence. But what I will say is that I had five other committee members, and some of them were really helpful. So I helped him with navigate the politics, and he made it through graduate school. And he didn't know what to do next or how to go about the next step. And I've been helping him with the politics and the process of applying for postdocs. And he's finished his first postdoc and is going for his second. I know this guy is going to succeed. And not only is he going to succeed, but he was the very first campus student campus champion for the Exceed project. He's a leader in the field. He's stepping forward, and he's trying to help his colleagues because he now wants to be a mentor to others. So I thought I had absolutely nothing to offer because I didn't know his field. We're not the same gender. We're not the same culture. And yet there's something I had to give. It's the same point you make. At certain times, you need different things. Yes? And someone once tell me that this relationship is like a marriage in a sense that you find somebody that you have a really good relationship with, but you can't really expect that person to do everything in your whole life for you. <laughs> you have to reach out and have other people come in. Yeah. And I think that that's what we need to think about, that you can't have a mentor mm -hmm. right. that's going to it take somebody from mentor. the pre-K through that postdoc. Mm -hmm. Because your needs to, evolve. You can't expect one person yeah, to do it all. You have to have people who can yeah. meet you at different points and bring different things to the table. Absolutely. OK, um, uh, there's one more question, and then we will move to the break. Yes. I just wanted to thank you for bringing up K-12, because really, of all this discussion, it, it boils down to identity. And I think it's really hard to form that identity when you're heading into post-secondary. It really starts much earlier. And I think there's great opportunity there to, to make real change. So thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how many people here work at all with K-12. Um, I, I just can't leave it behind because I love the kids. Um, and I love them all the way through. Although I would, will say middle school is a challenge when it's your own. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, they, they no longer belong to you at middle school. I don't know where they go. <laughs> but you still can love them. You just can't always, you just don't always like them. But I, I do, there's part of every, every kid has something that I love. So it, I do care about K-12, and I do think that it's not, we're not going to solve it unless we start it that early. And one of the things that breaks my heart, to be perfectly honest with you, with the Exceed program right now, is that all of their education and outreach programs start at undergraduate. And I think we're missing the boat unless we start earlier. So I'm really pleased that we perhaps have an opportunity to talk a little bit about what kinds of things we can do there at this meeting. And I know you've asked some really, really good questions in the way you've set it up. So I'm looking forward to working with the rest of you. Thank you.